Susan Zink with Montessori for Everybody TV. In one of our previous episodes recently, I asked you whether or not you did Montessori as a practice or Montessori as a hobby. And I encourage you to check out that episode if you haven't, not because it's about making a judgment, but it's about the promise of what Montessori education really has to offer. There's nothing wrong with doing a Montessori hobby in conjunction with your Montessori practice. But what we're going to talk about today is a really essential part of what I hope everyone who is attracted to Montessori in any way will really explore. This is, what is Montessori education? How do you do it? And why should you do it? Now, in some ways, all the episodes that we've done before have covered some parts of that, but I want to tie it together a little bit in this episode, because if you are just buying some Montessori stuff or you're going on some boards on the internet and, and finding some Montessori activities and doing them with your children, there is certainly nothing wrong with that and probably a lot right with it but you are not getting all of the benefit of Montessori that you could for your children, and I would suggest even for yourself. Now, I've also answered for myself in a previous episode the question, is Montessori easy? Well, this is one of the reasons that I wanted to talk to you about Montessori practice and how it's really the key. It's the foundation that has to happen if you really want to do Montessori education and have your children gain the benefits that it can offer. Montessori practice means changing the entire way that most people look at children. It includes changing the entire way that you look about it, look at education, the way you think about education, the way you think about learning. Montessori is about allowing the child or the learner, even the adult learner's inner teacher to run the show. That's it. If, if I wanted to put it in a nutshell, that would be what I would offer to you. And I believe it is the most deeply respectful way to approach human beings and especially children and people who are learning things. We have an inner teacher. Each one of us does. And that inner teacher is really what can guide us to the things that are going to bring us the next pieces that we need to learn in our lives. Whether we're an adult and we're attracted to Montessori education because we have no children, but we know we're looking for a way to work with children or to help our own children that we're going to have in our family in the future. When you're drawn to something that way, something amazing happens inside of you. There is an energy, there is a, um, a, a force that moves you toward that learning. Think about the last time you decided you were going to learn something and really wanted to learn it well. It could have been something really, really simple, maybe running a pretty user-friendly program, making use of, of a simple tool online or something, but you wanted to do it for your own purposes. And I'm guessing that unless it was a really awkward learning process because of what you were attempting to learn, that the learning was very joyful. If that is your experience, how can you generalize that to the rest of what you may do in your life and especially what you want for the children that you can influence? I'm going to suggest that Montessori education is about people being there in charge of their own learning and that this is really the only way true deep learning happens and the only way that people can choose what they need to learn to give their most unique gifts in the world. Now, if you are viewing this because you're thinking about children, which is probably most of you, how does this relate to how we make that happen? How do we help children follow that inner teacher? How do we guide them to follow that inner teacher rather than their inner uh, distractions? Now, there's some terms in Montessori education that I know a lot of people, especially these days, are very uncomfortable with. We, we talk in Montessori education about normalization, the normalized child. And that's something that people can bristle about, and I can understand that. What, what is normal? If you've ever observed a group of 30 children interacting, you know that there's no way you can 
put down a bunch of adjectives and say this is the normal. You're going to have different um, temperaments, you're going to have different energy levels, different tempos at which these different children act in their lives. And that is all normal. All of those different tempos, all those levels of energy can be displayed by children who have done what Dr. Montessori called normalization. Normalization is letting your own true gifts out in the world. And that means acting respectfully. It means acting with love toward other human beings. It even means honoring the gifts that others around you are giving. And this is truly what normal children do. If you haven't seen this, if you haven't seen a group of children acting with deep honor for one another's work, with deep respect for what their peers need, you haven't seen children who are who are just being who they are. And this is what Dr. Montessori was talking about. And it's a hard truth. If you really accept what she's saying, what the truth is, is that if you force education on children, if you force your will on children and you tell them what to do and you tell them when to do it and you fix their problems and you do for them what they can do for themselves, you are intruding on them and you are keeping them from behaving in a normal way. You're keeping their true gifts of their personality from emerging out in the world. And that's not easy to hear for most of us because for most of us, that's how you interact with children. You tie their shoes, you tell them to go to soccer, you set up their schedule, depending on what has either been normal for you in your childhood or what you have decided is what you want for your children. And I'm going to respectfully say that if you really want what's best for your children, you need to find a way for them to choose that. You need to find a way to get out of the way. You need to learn the skills that will allow you to leave your children to learn things that they want to learn in the way that they want to learn them at the pace with which they'd like to learn. And I'm going to suggest there's three things that are required for that. First is, mostly what I've been talking about so far in this episode, a recognition of the true nature of children. Children are not selfish. Children are not acquisitive. They're not attached to their belongings as a, a, a natural state. If they are in a state of establishing their own individuality, the twos, which can be very terrific twos if you understand how to work with them, once they have laid claim to an activity or an object, yes, they want to maintain that claim. They are learning how to say, I am an independent being in this world and I am separate from this little child beside me and I am separate from this mother. But I need to go and be close to this mother when, when I'm feeling like, hmm, not sure I really want to be separate yet. So if you understand the true nature of children, the general over, uh, overall nature of children, which is generous and loving and self-managed and independent, as well as the nature of children at particular stages of their devel development, whether or not it's that asserting independence stage of twos and later on in adolescence, or whether or not it is some of the very special periods that happen between birth and age six or seven where they have a particular window that allows them to learn language in an, in an amazing way. Um, everyone pretty much who is listening to this video knows that you don't teach a child his or her native language. They absorb it. That's where Dr. Montessori's term, the absorbent mind, comes in. So first, if you want to do right by children in the Montessori fashion or in any fashion, you need to understand the nature of the child. And this is not what you might think it would be if you wandered around in most of the Western or the, the first world cultures of the world. We do too much for our children. We don't permit them to learn the things that they need to learn at the times that they need to learn them. And we don't prepare an environment that will support that kind of learning. The second thing that has to happen is you have to change. You're an adult, unless this is just, oh yeah, oh yeah, 
all that's just normal. Every time I read anything that Dr. Montessori writes, that just seems completely normal. And that's been my experience my whole life. And I look around me and I just can't understand why anybody ever does something for a child that they could do for uh, anything. When I can't understand why anyone ever does for children what they can do for themselves. Um, I am completely comfortable with letting children explore within a prepared environment for as long as they need to do that. I feel no need to make sure they learn any particular skills. I trust their learning completely unless all of that is just completely without any emotional triggering for you you're going to need to change. If you want to do Montessori with your child, if you want to be a Montessori parent, if you want to be a Montessori grandparent, and especially if you want to be a Montessori educator, you're going to have to change inside of yourself. You're going to have to find those things that are filters that keep you from seeing children in their true nature you're going to have to use the reflection of people that you trust around you to help you discover filters that I'm going to suggest you'll never see for yourself. The only way you're going to discover some of the blocks you have to interacting with children the way that they really deserve to be interacted with is if you have the reflection of people who can see the blocks that you can't see. And finally, the third piece is the prepared environment. If a child has an inner teacher, which I absolutely know that they do. If that child then needs to learn by following that inner teacher, you can't be teaching them what they need to learn. You can't be the, the person on the stage imparting wisdom. You can't be the person who decides what this child is going to learn next. You have to prepare an environment where they can choose. This is the prepared environment. The prepared environment can be in a child's home. It can be in a classroom. <clears throat> and sometimes it's a little bit of both. If you have decided that on your own or with the help of a co-op uh, of like-minded parents that you're going to actually do full-blown Montessori ed education in the home for children ages three or older, you're going to need to set up a classroom environment in your home or in the home of one of your co-op members. It needs to be a full Montessori classroom. There need to be materials for development of the senses. There need to be prepared practical life activities where the children can do the work of daily life in a real fashion as long as they want to and with a wide variety to choose from. They need to learn the languages that they're learning, their native language, perhaps another language, with the help of materials that they touch with their hands that allow the hand, the eye, and the ear to work together in a developmentally appropriate way. They need to have the math materials. They need to have the ability to understand the new number system, to see the quantities that are going to allow them to make the leaps of scientific thinking, of logical thinking. They need to have those materials that will allow them to explore in ways that are completely developmentally appropriate while those windows are open, those windows of the sensitive period that Montessori talks about. Unless you have all three of those things working together, a clear understanding of the child, a transformation of the adult, so that that adult has consciously chosen to make changes in his or her personality so that the way of interacting with children is available to them, a respectful, a radically respectful way of interacting with children is available to that changed adult. Unless you have the understanding of the child, that radically changed adult, radical respect as their, their byword, and then a prepared environment created with understanding of the way children learn. Only if you have all those three things can you do Montessori. Now, if somebody wants to do a little bit of Montessori, I'm all for it. You want to use a little bit of Montessori manipulatives here. You want to check out a little bit of, of asking children before you touch them and try out some of the Montessori behaviors with children. Great. I am, I'm on your team. I'm in your corner. But I also am in your corner when you're ready to say, hey, this is, this is great stuff. 
this is the understanding of children that I need in order to move forward and I'm going to do Montessori full blown. I want my children to get everything they can get from the wonderful discoveries that were initiated by Dr. Montessori at the turn of the century and have been grown through a hundred years of people using these practices and developing them. If that's what you want for your children, that's what I want to support. That's what Montessori for Everybody is about. How do you do this and get all for your children that you possibly can through Montessori as a parent or an educator? If you've spent more than a few days in the classroom, and particularly if you've spent a few years in the classroom, you know that one of the most important times of the year is the start. The habits that are set up at that time are going to tend to be very tenacious. The children who either have been in the same classroom the previous year are coming back with a kind of new set of eyes, and so they will Will establish new habits and particularly any of the students who are brand new to that environment, they're going to anchor the behaviors that they develop in those first few days and weeks strongly to that physical space. So make sure that those first few days and weeks are you make good use of them to help your students and you develop good habits. If you are viewing this during the break before your regular school year starts, that is an ideal time to figure out what kinds of lessons need to happen in those first few days. And if by some chance you're viewing this while you are at the end of your classroom year and getting ready to go on break, that is a particularly excellent time. You have a year behind you where you can look around your classroom, you can physically walk around and see the things where you would like to have better habits established when you start the year again. You can see the pencil sharpening set up isn't exactly what you wanted it to be, or you may notice that the students don't seem to know how to use a bookend because they're fallen over or the books are, are kind of a mess any time, any place that you're relying on bookends. So I encourage you to either mentally, if you're not in your classroom and don't have access to it at this time, or literally, if you do, to walk around that classroom and think about the kinds of things that you want to make sure the students know how to do properly right at the beginning of the year. Now, I'm going to show you a few things that I consider to be um, frequently underused uh, ideas for beginning of the year lessons. These are practical life lessons for any student that uses the things that we're going to talk about. Whether they're a very young student or an older student, might be it will definitely be a slightly different lesson, but let's talk about what some of those things are. So the tools that you have in your classroom, your students need to know how to use from start to finish. And the reason that I say that is if you have scissors that have glue all over them, you haven't got a setup going where your students take care of using those scissors from start to finish because cleaning things up is finishing an exercise. If you have paint brushes in your classroom or texture brushes or foam paint brushes and they have any uh, residue on them, the students haven't learned how to use them properly. If you have paint brushes where the bristles are all splayed, the students haven't learned to use the brushes properly for painting to begin with. I would encourage you to look at any tools that are used in your classroom, pencil sharpeners, art tools, cleaning tools, and see which ones you need to think through the lesson presentation so that your children learn to use them well from the start. Now, because I'm talking about not just good habits, but also kind of setting up for those first few days of the school year, let's also think about some of the lessons that um, are good to have out at that time for other reasons as well. Now, you, your students should learn how to use their tools properly so that they can 
use them well and that you're not having to take care of them. And making sure that they can use scissors well uh, is certainly something to look at. Occasionally you'll even find a much older child that can't. If, assuming that you're working with older children and they know how to use regular scissors well, Perhaps they don't know how to use pattern scissors. And that's something that's a really good beginning of the year lesson, beginning of the year material to have on your art shelf because it takes very little for you to show them how to do it, but there's a challenge involved and it would be appropriate work that could develop concentration. And remember, concentrated work is kind of the goal of everything that we're doing. Using a ruler appropriately deciding when to use a transparent ruler, when to use a metal ruler with a raised surface, uh, such as a, a, cor a cork backing, so that if you're trying to use a ruler with a felt tip pin or uh, a marker, that you can do that without smearing your work. And then, if you've done that, you're going to have to learn how to clean that ruler so that it's not going to smear someone else's work or smear all over someone's fingers. So that relates to tools. Um, I'm going to mention it in relation to keeping your classroom clean, especially if you're viewing this at a time that you're setting up a brand new classroom or getting your classroom ready for next year. You're going to want to think through the tools that the children use to keep the classroom clean. Montessori obvious things are that the tools are sized to the child. If you're going to have a polishing exercise in the three to six classroom, you need tiny little mitts that will uh, allow the children to use them with a couple of fingers. If you're using microfibers, which I've, I've advocated in several segments of this program, having a mitt is usually easier for, for some of your children. I have two kinds of microfibers here. These are specifically for um, very high gloss surfaces like glass um, and then your regular dusting and cleaning um, cloths. If they're done in mitts, you're going to find that they're going to be used more, you will find that some of the children will be much more successful. Now at the same time that you're setting your materials up, you need to be setting up that presentation. What are all the steps? If you're going to use microfibers, damp, for cleaning up after snack or lunchtime, what happens next? How are you going to keep them from having the um, germs grow in them? Are they going to be rinsed out and set on a rack? Are they sent home with someone every day if you live in a very humid area? Are they sent home once a week and you have the children kind of lay them around uh, some of the cleaning areas so that they get a little bit of air to them? This is the kind of process that you need to go through so those habits that you're teaching at the very beginning of the year serve everyone. So let's talk about just a few more possibilities. Let's always look at practical life. Do your children know how to read a thermometer? Do you have a thermometer outside the classroom so they can check the temperature before they go out for uh, midday playtime or an outside lunch or something so they can decide whether they want to, to wear a jacket? That would be a practical life exercise for the beginning of the year. Do they know how to take care of their uh, things that are left over after lunch? This is a sign about which things can be composted and can't you would probably want to have a sign that is just pictures to help your students know which things go in your recycling bin. Do you have children who tend to get confused there? So you need to have a very careful setup where they gather up their recycling first and they take it and put it in the recycling bin in one part of the classroom and then they take their garbage and put it in a separate bin. Maybe you have your younger children have a lunch buddy who checks to make sure when they think they have their, their um, things sorted into compost, recycling, and trash, that their lunch buddy, who's an older child, helps them. These are the kinds of things I'm encouraging you to think through now. And the last piece in terms of tools for this, I mentioned bookends. Uh, a lot of children, a lot of homes, taking good care of things isn't something that, uh, that people give as much attention to as perhaps they have at some other times. So using a bookend appropriately. If you're putting a book back on a shelf that has a bookend, you need to be careful that you're not shoving the bookend where the, the pages would get jammed up in the bookend. In my classrooms, I've always taught the children the, the library convention of shelving to the front. Makes your shelves look really nice, means that it's easier to see the spines. So if these are the kind
kinds of things that you would like to set up in your classroom, then you need to think about them ahead of time. Using a map. Now, particularly if you have a lot of maps in your classroom that are not laminated, even if you have some that are, you need to teach the children how to roll and unroll the maps carefully. You need to teach them to put them back in their containers carefully. In an upper elementary classroom, I had a, a wine rack that I got from a thrift store that I used to, to store my maps in, but the children had to be taught to put them in carefully so the edges of the map stayed nice. And finally, if you're going to have artsy, craftsy, um, game kind of exercises out at the beginning of the year, choose them carefully. Now, especially if you have what I call a transition classroom, you may have a lot of children coming into a classroom, even a classroom for older children, having no idea how to function in a Montessori classroom. If that's true, one of the things that's going to create success in that classroom for you are several exercises that you can present either in the large group quickly or to individual children or small groups of children quickly and that they can be relatively successful with quickly but then become more successful over time. Um, you may be familiar with some little beads like this. They can be fused to make a permanent thing but they don't have to be. It is a hand coordination and patterning exercises, exercise that can be done over and over again. The beads are placed on the forms. If you're going to make a permanent craft, you then fuse them with an iron. Putting parchment paper in between the beads and the iron works well in my experience. But this is an exercise that can just be a process exercise for learning to create patterns. And most children, up through at least the age of 10, 10 or 11, will have some manual skill that is developed with it and definitely some of their artistic design skills. If you're going to have things like puzzles in the classroom that are not the Montessori map puzzles or some of the other botany puzzles and things like that, make sure they are challenging. Um, this is a puzzle where the little um, people fit together in a, a puzzle format and it's very challenging. If you have things like this and they're not challenging, they're not going to serve you. Remember what the purpose of the time in the Montessori classroom is. It's to help children to develop their personality. The way that this happens in the Montessori classroom is that the child chooses a work, takes that work off the shelf, completes the cycle of activity in completing that work in a successful way with focused attention. There is a sense of accomplishment. There is a sense of completion that comes with this. Please make sure that you set up for success at the beginning of the year by choosing to give the lessons that you need to so that the children will successfully manage a peaceful, orderly classroom and that they have good experiences right from the beginning of focused, concentrated work. I'm Susan Zink with Montessori for Everybody TV and we have just finished our 50th episode. I want to tell you about a little guide that I have put together to help you make the most of the episodes that we've done so far. Our episode guide for the first 50 will give you the titles of all of the different episodes, but much more importantly, it will help you to explore where you need to to improve your Montessori practice. If you have been running into problems, if you feel like maybe you have a complete Montessori training, you've had a school for a while, or you've been doing Montessori in your home for a few years, and things just aren't working the way you hear other people talking about, Maybe you are brand new to Montessori education, but you've heard all these things that kind of concern you. It's hard and you put in all this work and then it doesn't work. Or maybe you just want to do it the best that you can. This guide will give you some different ways to approach how to learn to do that. So I hope that you will um, sign up on our website. That's all that you have to do to get this episode guide. It's, it's completely free of charge. And then it will allow you to make the best use of that resource that we've already put online free for you. The Montessori for Everybody TV show, our first 50 episodes. If you took notes on your own class after episode 42, pull those out now. 
They'll help you know which habits need work and guide you in making the best use of the things you learned in this episode.